closing the abdomen and you know different things about I'm gonna try to do this talk. I don't have a slides for this, but for the nephrology for me, it's very straightforward. So I'm gonna try to make this talk very clinically useful because you guys are gonna be frontline and you're gonna be making decisions in the urgent care in the ER. And it's important that you know, you know which patients you need to pay attention. So I'm gonna cover topics. Like I'm gonna cover, typically on the boards, they ask you about some GNs. It's not a lot of glomerulonephritis. It's more like the, so we can talk today. We can talk about, let, I'm trying to think about what we're gonna be using our time. We have two hours. So I'm gonna think about doing uh, acute kidney injury. It's useful, because you guys need that, especially if you're gonna be like rotating. You need to know a lot about AKI. Um, and we can do GNs or interstitial diseases of the kidney. Why don't we start with acute kidney injury? So I'm going to give you a hypothetical case and we're going to do back and forth questions. Okay, so I have, uh, let's say I have an 83 year old guy who goes in for an elective cholecystectomy. And the guy goes in, the surgery goes fine, and on day two he's urinating about 200 cc's. Do you call that acute kidney injury or do you call it renal failure? How do we call that? Or what's the definition of renal failure or acute kidney injury? So we don't call it renal failure anymore because it's an intimidating word. Like especially if you're a patient or a family, kidney failure meaning that you're never going to recover. And the good thing is that most patients with that type of kidney recover, the kidney injury recover. So let's talk about, so the definition of Acute kidney injury is either you, your serum creatinine goes up or your urine output drops. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that we normally see is the urine output dropping and the creatinine starts increasing the following day. So when you get called in the hospital, they tell you, hey, Dr. Sanso, your, your patient's urine output is dropped to 300 cc in the last 24 hours. Guaranteed the next thing that the next morning you're going to have an, a bump in the creatinine. So there's only four things that can actually bring down creatinine. You guys know which ones? It can bring down. Yeah. yeah. If your patient's creatinine is high, there's three things that can bring it down. Uh, one is called dialysis. dialysis yeah. Another one is called a transplant. Okay. And another one is called a renal recovery. That's okay. that's it. This, so it's no rocket science. So nephrology is pretty straightforward. If you think about it, and your job in the ward is or in the ER, you're like a detective. And for nephrology, I always teach students that the most important thing is like the questions that you ask. And by the time you present the patient to me, your, your diagnosis should be made. And if you don't know the diagnosis, probably your attending doesn't know the diagnosis. And then we, we're going to be talking about like, are we dealing here with zebras or are we dealing with the normal hoof sound, which is a horse? Most of the times you're going to be dealing with horses, especially like being a frontline worker. So yes, that, that gentleman definitely has acute kidney injury. And how do you guys divide up kidney disease or kidney injury? Remember when you, in school, they tell you, okay, there is a pre-renal, yeah, like remember? Or like what are the three categories, major categories? Are you talking about pre-renal, post-renal, which are... And then, like, right, and then, and then what's the other one? Intrinsic, or like the, uh, yeah. So, pre-renal, mm -hmm. the differential is it's probably somewhat big. Intrinsic is a whole year of my, my fellowship. It's like the intrinsic renal failure. Yeah. And then the post-renal is very easy to rule out. And I'm going to teach you useful tips okay. when you guys are actually um, when you're actually doing the the workup of these patients. So pre-renal. So what causes of pre-renal renal failure? You guys know? Stenosis. Which one? What kind of stenosis? Uh, renal arterial. Stenosis. No, that that would be intrinsic renal. How is that so? Yeah, with pre-renal, pre-renal is more like decreased renal perfusion. Mm -hmm. So what, what things could, could, let, could lead in? Let's say this guy that I'm giving you. Sepsis. Sepsis, so that's a type of shock. There is different types of shock. Remember, we talk about hypovolemic shock. If somebody's bleeding profusely, or if you're like completely volume contracted, either because you have like severe nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, fever, you know, like a heat stroke or things like that. So, that's the hypovolemic shock. And we also have what we know as distributive shock. Do you guys know what is a distributive shock? Like anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis. Very vasodilated. And what are the, what other entities that's very, very common cause of death? Liver failure, maybe? Liver failure, yes. But, um, Colloid pressure. Yeah, liver failure. Thanks for bringing it up. I'm going to tell you what happens in liver failure. But 
sepsis, for instance, in the hospital, you're going to be called all the time, or a lot of my business, business comes from patients that go, they go on sepsis, and there's decreased renal perfusion, so we call that distributed shock, because there's a lot of like release of um, nitric oxide, and, and um, there is, the body starts like trying to preserve perfusion to important organs like the brain and the heart, and there's a lot of peripheral vasodilatation and renal vasodilatation and the perfusion drops and the kidneys shut down. And the kidneys are very commonly involved. The kidneys are so sensitive, especially the aging kidney. And I get a lot, a lot of my, my consoles are from the geriatric population because, you know, you probably as a surgeon, you saw that operating on, a, on an elderly person is like, they're so tenuous, you know, they, anything can go wrong. Perfusion can drop, they get an MI or get a stroke or they go into renal failure. So this is, quite common of my my day-to-day -day job in liver failure now that you're mentioning there is an entity called hepatorenal syndrome have you guys heard about a hepatorenal syndrome so hepatorenal syndrome is it's an interesting physiopathology because if i were to take those kidneys let's say that i remove those kidneys from this patient and i transplant into people with kidney with kidney failure those kidneys are structurally speaking they're good it's just that when the liver fails, they're very interconnected. The heart, the kidney, the heart, the liver, and the kidneys are very dependent on each other. So when there is liver failure, there's a lot of release of nitric oxide, and there is peripheral vasodilatation, and that's why those patients are very hypotensive. When you see a cirrhotic, like a bad cirrhotic, you know, like you see the spectrum of different diseases, but most patients, they, you know, they, with mild cirrhosis, they, they really, they look normal, but patients with advanced cirrhosis, they're always hypotensive. You look at them and they're always like blood pressure in the 90s, 100s. So a little extra insult is enough to put those patients into renal failure. And it's one of those entities that is very sad to see. Um, let, let, let me give you examples. Throughout my career, I've had very young alcoholic patients coming into the hospital with liver failure and the kidneys shut down and we cannot offer dialysis to those patients because dialysis is just a bridge therapy for liver transplant. And there is a rule that you can be, you, you have to be sober for some time, like for at least six months. Most transplant centers, this is one year, but some they're changing it like for six months, demonstrated that they're not doing any substances mm -hmm. to be able to qualify for a liver transplant. So imagine how sad the patients are still awake and you're telling them, you know what, this is it. Make sure you talk to your family because you're going to get very confused in the next 48 hours and, and die. So it's, very, it's a very challenging entity and there's no effective treatment other than transplant, liver transplant. But for those patients that don't, that the liver failed unrelated to substance abuse or alcohol abuse, they do get dialyzed. And they're very sick, some of them make it, some of them don't, but that's the physiopathology. So that's the second type of shock. So we talk about hypovolemic, distributive, and what's the other third time? cardiogenic shock. So cardiogenic shock is quite common in clinical practice. You have to suspect it when you get called, you get invited to participate in one of these patients. Every time you see a patient that's hypotensive, the question you need to ask yourself, number one, is this an accurate blood pressure? Sometimes the patients are morbidly obese, their blood pressure is not accurately taken, or they have severe peripheral vascular disease. Just make sure the nurse do, do it in, in two extremities. Um, that's the first question you ask yourself. Second question is, is this medication induced? Medication induced hypotension, quite common in, hy in hypertensive patients or patients that they're actually, perfect example is that patients that, that they go to you and you, you scare them, you tell them, you know what, you're going in the wrong direction, you need to lose weight, you need to eat low sodium, you need to start taking your medications and you do everything at the same time. That's why I never almost, you know, when I was talking to you guys about hypertension, I almost never start high on my management because I want to see, I want to give the opportunity to see if the patient is following lifestyle modifications, if they're following sodium restriction. Sodium restriction makes a humongous difference in these patients. You're going to see it in this practice about the difference between sodium, patients that are compliant, the ones that are non-compliant in, in, in terms of heart failure, the same thing with kidney failure. So, and I start them with one antihypertensive, but doing everything at the same time, you can basically, you can tank those patients and go in the wrong direction. So this is an example, like medication induced hypotension. And then the third thing you think about is like, okay, is this is sepsis. I mean, this patient has SERS criteria. Are you guys familiar with the SERS criteria? Yeah. Yeah, so SERS sepsis, you know, if, if you're in the urgent care, you need to know this by heart. I'm going to share something that happened last week. 
I had a patient, um, one of my renal transplant patients. She went to the urgent care um, because she had a fever of 103. The doctor in the urgent care hydrated her, gave her Tylenol, and did basic labs. The labs didn't look bad enough. So it was just the very beginning of the disease process. And she documented influenza-like symptoms, patient is feeling better, sent home. You do not ever discharge a patient, a transplant patient, because they're, you guys know for a fact that they're immunosuppressant. They're immunosuppressed. They're very different. A transplant patient, something to remember from this rotation, a transplant and a dialysis patient, they're very different. You can, you know, dialysis patients are very debilitated and by, by definition they're immunocompromised. And a lot of them are diabetic, so you have two, two reasons to be immunosuppressed, right? Mm -hmm. So this, this lady discharged this patient that I'm telling you, and the lady went back. Fortunately, she was smart enough, she's a nurse. She, went, she, was, she was six hours in the house, she felt terrible again, she came back. This time she was, she was profoundly hypotensive, went to the ICU, her kidney transplant started failing. After five, six days in the, in the ICU, she came back and the kidney, it was a happy end, right? Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is that you do not want to be that provider because she got QI. You guys know what QI means? So every hospital or every institution has a, a quality improvement process. Mm -hmm. And it's not punitive, but it's just to improve quality. And every organization has it, especially these days we're getting paid for performance. We're not getting paid for volume or for fee for service. You know, the way that historically reimbursement in healthcare has been changing to quality. It's a quality base versus instead of doing procedures, we're trying to demonstrate there is quality. So every organization has a very intense um, quality improvement committee and you get graded depending on how bad you did it. So just to give you an example, in my organization is zero is you didn't do anything wrong, shit happens, I'm sorry, but you know, things happen, right? Number one is don't do it again. Number two, you're really messed up. And you get a couple of those or three of those, that's it. And she got a, she got a two for that case. So my advice to you guys is transplant patient with fever needs to come in for observation. Especially, it was un inconceivable that an urgent care doctor, and I'm telling you this because you're gonna be, I've done mm, thousands and thousands of hours in the urgent care, it's still moonlight in the urgent care here and there. And the urgent care is the easier place, and I, I don't mean to scare you with, with these words, I just mean to teach you how to, how to do things right, and to recognize, because to be able to survive urgent care, you need to have, you need to have a set of skills. You need to have people skills because you need to bond with your patient in those five, ten minutes that you're going to have. So you need to have like all these qualities of like, hey, how are you? I'm so sorry. Thank you for waiting for me. I'm so sorry you're here. All, all of that stuff they always tell you, that's, that's probably as important as, as your medical knowledge. Second part is to be solid in your medical knowledge. There's no way that you being an urgent care doctor, you're going to send someone with a transplant with a fewer 103 without a chest x-ray or without a UA. That's like first year medical school like teaching. Full fever workup, UA, urine culture, and, and she didn't do a lactic acid. She has search criteria on arrival. She didn't do a lactic acid. She didn't do an x-ray of the chest. She didn't do a UA or urine culture, not even a blood culture. Just basic labs, send the patient home after it felt better. So I'm just telling you, because those are the kind of stuff that are useful information for you, because at the end of the day, in, in three years from now, you're going to be laughing about this Krebs cycle because nobody knows about that. I mean, ask me any question about the Krebs cycle. I couldn't care less. I don't use it at all in clinical practice. But you need to survive this part of your career like, like pretty intensely. And then you need to understand what are the things that you cannot miss. And things like that when you guys are in the front line. And the urgent care, going back to what I'm saying, can be a dangerous place to practice because there's no time for bonding number one so the patients when they do patient surveys the doctors that are working in the urgent care or the ER they get the lowest scores and the reason is is obvious there's no bonding and the second thing is that you need to have people skills efficiency skills and and knowledge and these are the kind of stuff so that's the other stuff the, the septic the cardiogenic so cardiogenic when we are a patient there is this patient having an MI or maybe have had an MI? But then there's other things that can give you hypotension, like such as adrenaline deficiency. We can talk about uh, endo next time I come. Endo is also big on, on your board. So adrenaline deficiency, 
you guys know how how to respect the name of the You guys know which places you can be worth? What kind of questions you have? Maybe somebody that's like uh, hypothermic or somebody that has mm -hmm. uh, like a Pigment, hyper pigmentation. Mm -hmm. So like, like somebody who's failure to thrive, like diarrhea, mm -hmm. hypotension, or so stasis, um, prior history of rheumatology disease, mm -hmm. or even patients that have had like multiple steroid injections for, you know, DJD or mm -hmm. some sort of like OA or self-sided type of thing. Um, yeah, so in your injury care, so this gentleman that I told you about, the 83 year old guy that got the cold infection, so I want you guys to formulate a little differential for the acute kidney injury. What do you guys think happened to that guy? You want to ask? What could, what could go wrong in the war? Well, I can tell you many things. Okay. <laughs> well, this could be long surgery and the position of the patient on the table. Right. This could be. Uh, yeah, uh, cold absolutely. Cold That's a very good. I've done two cases actually when I get called to participate for renal failure post-surgery, they go into rhabdo. Right. They go into rhabdo because the nurses didn't reposition the patient or he's in the hospital. Just position. long surgery. Yeah. Just long so surgery. Right. Any other, like, yeah, that's that's very true. So that's 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 definitely a, a it's not common, but it's suspected in every patient. Every patient that in on your boards, every everybody they every time they say that they found it down, you think about rhabdo. That's no, the okay. key word. No. That's the keyword for your for your boards. Found down, rhabdo until proven otherwise. How do you assess for rhabdo? Uh, your analysis CK level. Or Just a CPK level. Okay. Yeah. Do you guys know what a abnormal value enough oh. to oh. En enough to say like okay this guy's in renal failure because of that? In the thousands probably. In the thousands, in the so five thousand yeah. and above. Yeah. And sometimes they stop diluting the assay when it's already like sixty thousand positive still, and then no. yeah, they just they just stop. They just say like greater than sixty thousand. So rhabdo is is not. I'm gonna say it's not common cause of renal failure, but when it happens, it can be very dramatic because the pigments is called. It, it falls into a big category of renal failure. It's called pigment-induced AKI. There is a deposition of myoglobin, and myoglobin is is it causes an ischemic for, form of ATN. Have you guys heard about ATN? Mm -hmm. Acute tubular necrosis. So we're gonna talk a lot about acute tubular necrosis today. So. Um, this pigment-induced AKI can happen, you know, for crush injuries, patients found down, status post, uh, status epilepticus, um, post-surgical state like that was saying, and um, they sometimes, you know, the management is that we blast them with lots of fluids. You know, mm -hmm. you you want to make sure they're making 200 cc's, 200 cc's of urine per hour, but you got to be careful because when you're giving that amount of fluid to someone. And if they're going to worsen renal failure and they're becoming oliguric, you can put them into pulmonary disease. So a lot of the times when I get invited to those cases, you know, it's a disaster already. And then I need to dialyze them. But um, ultimately, those patients develop ATN from, from pigment induced AKI. Okay, what else do you think can cause AKI on this individual, this gentleman? Post-operative infection, maybe, or very good. But do you think on day two we're going to see that? No. Remember the W is kind of cool as that. Wind, water, wind, the, the wound, the wind, wind, water, water, wind, wind, water, walking, wonder drugs, wonder drugs, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's a useful money. Um, but on day two, it's a, it, it's Not possible. Material, yeah. it, it's possible, but it's less like you know, less like they really did like messed up or mm -hmm. patients went into really bad. But what's common in the OR? What happens when you're under general anesthesia and somebody's cutting you? What could happen? Oh, you, uh, your body reacts as if it's awake to that. So there's still get, you still get a, a response like when you get cut, like your body still. But what could happen like with your blood pressure? Low blood pressure. Exactly. Blood pressure. Anesthesia. Exactly. So even they've done studies and ATN can still happen even in 50% of the patients with undocumented hypotension. You know, now with the type of equipment that we have in the operating room, pretty much every event, like back in the days when I was in med school, we had a circulating nurse like documenting the blood pressure in a piece of paper, and now there's no such a thing, it's just a computer, and you can actually, you as a consultant, I can just click and I will see everything in the water, what happened. But still, you know, you can get like decreased renal perfusion or intra intraoperative hypotension, and that can translate into ATM, remember? 
ATMs. We're gonna, you're gonna hear a lot about ATMs today. So that's one thing. So other thing is like, you're, you're, you develop hypovolemic shock from fluid shift, distribution, bleeding. You know, usually a surgeon is mentioned how much is the blood loss or any events, but that's also always something to suspect. Especially, especially if you have a patient with a drop in hemoglobin, mm -hmm. you need to always scan it because blood can be in the abdominal cavity very, very easily. You can have two or three liters there and you don't even know there's blood. I mean, you have to do a good exam and the patient usually have like, uh, how do you call that, this flank? Uh, great. Yeah. For Collins, Collins is for pancreatitis, right? Is that yeah, Collins, Collins, yeah. yeah. Collins in the peri umbilical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you have a red superitoneal hematoma, you can actually see like the bruises. So make sure you examine your patients, you bring them up and look at the back. Okay, so that's quite common. But what else could happen if I'm giving you an 83 year old male? What could happen to an 83 year old male? I didn't tell you a female for a reason. Mm -hmm. What could happen to a male? Mm -hmm. Which organ males have that females don't have? Uh, prostate, prostate and the prostate, prostate, right? retention. Right? So urinary retention is a common, very common cause of kidney problems. And it's very easy to rule it out. How do you guys rule it out if you're in the wards? Scan with the bladder. The bladder, right? Yeah. So you tell the nurse, how are you going to write the order? Tell me how you're going to write the order. Uh, uh, post void. Assess for post void residual. And the, what, what does that entail? The patient needs to pee, they right? Pee, they, and they, yeah, they see how much they urinated and they see how much is left. And how much is abnormal? Mm -hmm. What's the amount that is considered abnormal? Oh, uh, I think like over, like, it's a very small amount, like uh, yeah, 25 or 50 milliliters. Not clinically relevant. I mean, everybody should empty the bladder the completely. But to be clinically significant for me to attribute like some degree of the renal problem, I would say probably 200. 200, 200 yeah. So. And it, what if you don't have a bladder scan? Say, hey, if we don't have a bladder scan, what do we do? You get ultrasound him or CT scan. That's kind of a, would you like to get a hundred x-rays? If he's old, I don't know, yeah. Yeah, like no, and, and I don't think you can calculate volume, urinary volume with the, okay. with the CT. So let's say that you're in a small hospital or you're in a small yeah. urgent yeah. care yeah. catheter. Yeah. So the same thing, you tell the nurse, <coughs> assess post void residual, the same procedure, you're gonna pee, you're gonna pass the catheter. And then you're gonna write, the only difference is you're gonna write in the, on the order, like leave fully in place if you're in a, if, uh, if a post void residual greater than 200. Okay. That's how you're gonna write it. And then you need to start them on, on an alpha blocker. I don't start patients on, on one of those testosterone inhibitors, but mm -hmm. that's, that's beyond my scope of practice. Okay. But in the urgent care, you can start very safely, you can start someone on an alpha blocker, mm -hmm. and you can refer the patients for outpatient urology follow up. And they don't want to attempt to remove the catheter like in the first week or two. And the patients hate it, but what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. If they go to the urgent care and then they have renal failure mm -hmm. and then you, you diagnose them with post obstructive renal failure, you have to tell them there's nothing you can do. If you take it out, you're going to come back the next day or the next few hours because that's, that's quite painful. And that's another cause of like, it causes like a lot of hypertension when the patients come obstructed. Um, okay, so. But what else, what else in an, like, if you go to the OR, right? Mm -hmm. They give you pain management, right? Mm -hmm. So even if your patient is a female, she can still have the neurogenic bladder. Right. And mm -hmm. I'm gonna tell you, when I had my appendix removed, I couldn't be. Mm -hmm. I was discharged four hours after my surgery because I was, I knew I had appendicitis, I walked in, the doctor told me, why are you here? Like, I have appendicitis. Like, how do you know that dude, I have appendicitis. And then I got operated on, like, right away. And I couldn't go because I couldn't pee with it for the morphine. Mm -hmm. So always remember that that an important milestone before you discharge someone home, you can't send them out if they're not peeing. Mm -hmm. And that's common sense, right? But very, very commonly people that discharge patients and they come back and they can't pee. So think about even if it's a female patient, they can have a neurogenic bladder from the opiates or from anti antihistamines like you know, the anticholinergic effect. Let's say they gave him Benadryl the night before. That in itself, an old person can make them, can make them return. Okay. So what other conditions do you guys know that give you a neurogenic bladder? Mm -hmm. Spinal coordination. Mm -hmm. Core lesions, yeah. Fortunately, they're not common. But mm -hmm. Of course, core lesions, but very common. What's the most common cause of neurogenic bladder, guys? 
Let me let me let me make you an easier question. What's the most common cause of kidney failure? Mm -hmm. no, no. Which one? No, no. The, no. the most common cause of kidney failure among, among the world in the world. Fifty percent of the patients with kidney failure they have diabetes. 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 So diabetes is the most common cause of neurogenic. Uh, you know yeah. you know how diabetes how diabetes is a nasty disease, right? Yeah. We all agree. <laughs> right? So we have the neurogenic manifestations. I'm going to name some of them so you guys are familiar because you need to know this in neurogenic care. So if you develop a gastroparesis, mm -hmm. it's very common. Diabetes. Diabetes, right? And so you just look at the, you assess the, the time, the duration, but that's a manifestation. Another manifestation is the autonomic dysfunction. So these patients, you're going to see them here in the clinic that they, whoa, they drop 40 points when they stand up. You know, they have a, they have a disease you know, like autonomic system, you know, the sympathetic and parasympathetic, they can work the same way like ours mm -hmm. to correct for position changes. So that's that's another manifestation of diabetic. The, the, the one that you hear the most is the pins and needles or the ends crawling, mm -hmm. which is the diabetic peripheral neuropathy. Mm -hmm. In males, you have the erectile dysfunction, which is pretty common. In, in advanced diabetes, with other end organ damage, you see neurogenic bladder. Do you guys know how we manage that condition? And that's a, I'm teaching you this because I want you to scare the heck out of your patients. Super well, for those, that's, that's less desire, but sometimes you need to put that. Say it again? Like an in and out cath. How many times a day? How many times do you avoid every day? Um, I go a lot. <laughs> Probably like five or six, right? Yeah. That's exactly what you need to do for the rest of your life. So imagine, it's called CIC. When you guys are reading medical mm -hmm. CIC, clean intermittent catheterization, CICs. So when you're documented like the neurogenic bladder on CIC, you already know what that means. Clean intermittent catheterizations. So a lot of the times they can't even do, imagine, sometimes they're so impaired, they can't even do it themselves. Mm -hmm. they need to have someone else. Like imagine like we are quality of life having someone else doing this for you four or five times. So that in itself, that, that, that's a pretty ominous and pretty scary manifestation of diabetes for sure with your patients because you know, diabetes is a staging killer most patients don't listen unfortunately okay so yeah so the neurogenic aspect I want you guys to always think about it it's very easy so you cannot miss neither the pre-renal or the post-renal because it's, it's done talking to the patient you know if you ask them hey have you been having uh, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting mm -hmm. okay so before I jump into the intrinsic, and we're going to talk about GNs because I want to make sure that we cover everything about renal acute renal failure. We don't call it renal failure. I, I take that <laughs> acute kidney injury. So I want to I want to ask you guys about com common offenders of the kidneys, like 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 NSAIDs. NSAIDs. Okay. I want to I want to take a step back <clears> because <throat> I want to make sure that every student that I that I encounter they understand that they're very useful medicines, mm -hmm. especially for you guys that you're gonna be frontline in the ER urgent care, or if you go and work in an ortho practice or some sort of like pain, pain control. But I want you to think about, take a step, just take a pause for one second and think about a few things that they're completely contraindicated. So what is the first contraindication for instance? You guys know? Peptic ulcer disease. Bleeding peptic ulcer, yeah, it's a big no-no. What else? Uh, chronic renal, uh, renal insufficiency. insufficiency. Don't use them if the patient has renal insufficiency. Malpractice. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't defend that. If the patient's going to renal failure, or reversible renal failure, it's on you. You can't defend that because it's everywhere. Everybody knows that. So, NSAIDs, they're very toxic to the kidneys in several ways. I'm gonna mention some of them so you guys are familiar. So they how do they work? How how do lenses work? What kind of substance they inhibit? Oh the cop the cop. No. Cop they inhibit prostaglandins. 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 And prostaglandins are the natural vasodilators of the kidney. So when you inhibit prostaglandins, you're causing it's the same reason why you bleed, because you're shutting down circulation to your, your gut. Same thing happens in the kidneys. And you're basically, you don't have a vasodilation, you have vasoconstriction, and it causes a ferrin artery, arterial vasoconstriction. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens. So another contraindication 
if you have bad heart failure, you cannot prescribe NSAIDs. You cannot prescribe NSAIDs. At UCLA, in the main entrance of the CCU, mm -hmm. the coronary care unit, there is a little there's a little sign that one of the attendants put. In this unit, we do not prescribe NSAIDs. If you don't know the reasons, ask your attending. It says like that. You can imagine the, the, the poor resident or fellow that ended up giving NSAIDs to, to, to a patient with heart failure. The same reason. If you have cardiorenal syndrome, have you guys heard about cardiorenal? Okay, so we talk about hepatorenal. Mm -hmm. Cardiorenal is a s similar physiopathology, and the, the, it's just you're completely vasodilated when you're in heart failure. You have your systemic vascular resistance is pretty high, mm -hmm. and your renal perfusion is very poor. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing. The kidneys are fine, but it's just like, imagine if you have a garden and you put a little bit of water pressure. The, the flowers are still going to be alive, but they're doing bad, right? Same thing happens. If I were to take those kidneys and put them in a good heart, those kidneys are going to thrive. Mm -hmm. Same concept. Cardiorenal syndrome is very common. A lot of the patients that you're going to be seeing here, like the patients with bad cardiomyopathy, like EF 20 or less, those patients, they, they, the kidneys, structurally speaking, they're not bad. It's just they have cardiorenal syndrome. So for the same token, you don't prescribe insects to to bad heart failure. So we already have three. Peptic cause disease, kidney disease, and heart failure, okay? And there are other relative contraindications that I'm obligated to share with you. Mm -hmm. So NSAIDs is a very common cause of secondary hypertension. On your boards, you're gonna get, you're gonna get two scenarios on your boards. One is a young female on OCPs coming in with hypertension. And they're going to ask you what is the next step on the management and they're going to want to treat you. So you answer, start her on hydrochlorothiazide. That's not the answer. The answer is consider changing the OCPs to something else, right? So by the same token, NCs are notorious for secondary hypertension. It, if you take them long enough, they cause hypertension. Because they uh, are basically constrained. Yeah. Increases Increase the renal resistance and then releases of renin and mm -hmm. all the cycles. So if you have a patient with hypertension, I'm not saying you cannot use them, but you need to warn the patients that, you know, you should, you can, let's say somebody comes with clearly an inflammatory pathology. Let's say you have a deltoid tendinitis, right? Mm -hmm. And the patients, you know that they will benefit from a short course of uh, NSAIDs. My advice to you is not malpractice to prescribe them, but my advice to you is to tell the patient to keep an eye on the blood pressure. If you feel that your blood pressure is getting too high, you need to stop it. But if you see another patient with resistant hypertension, what's the definition of resistant hypertension, by the way? Three drug failure and three resistant. Three drugs, three maximum drugs, doses, including the diuretic. Yeah, including, the including the diuretic. Or four drugs with controlled hypertension. So if you see somebody with four drugs, probably not a good idea to prescribe it in the sense, right? So we do them all the time, and lastly, the FDA recommend against the use of NSAIDs in everybody over the age of 60. Just to tell you how, how it, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, you're probably wondering like, why the hell do they sell those things in the, in the pharmacy over the counter, right? Mm -hmm. Because they can be, I have 170 dialysis patients myself. I can confidently say that five of them are there because of ibuprofen. And one of my attendants, he used to tell me that Aliv and Adil they paid off the kids college just to tell you how crazy that the dimension of the problematic the scope of the problematic is just huge and in this country you're going to see people that they for either financial reasons or for ignorance they avoid medical care and they, they start medicating themselves and when they have like a chronic injury or something mm -hmm. or they have one or two or three jobs what do they do they take NSAIDs they need to function right so you're gonna see these very common, very common in your in your practice. So that's another contraindication in the elderly. Can you give it to a very healthy 65-year-old? Looks great. I think so. But you need to understand what to give and what not to give. And 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 when you're giving it to someone that you're not supposed to, make sure you document that it was discussed not to use it for more than five or seven days. It was advised to monitor his blood pressure and to stop if hypertension ensues. You know, simple tips because this is what's going to protect you down the road. Okay, so, oh, 
I forgot to mention, so I, talk, I, I told you about the vasoconstriction, right? But NSAIDs in the kidneys can actually participate in other types of uh, intrinsic renal failure, including, um, I'm sure you heard about AIN, acute interstitial nephritis. Have you guys heard about that condition? We're gonna talk about it in a minute. Acute interstitial nephritis. It can also cause um, um, a minimal change disease. Have you guys heard about minimal change disease? Mostly in pediatric population, right? Mm -hmm. In in adults, we see it associated with what condition? Do you remember? Um, this is a bold question. Virus. Um, no, uh, no, that's that's actually hepatitis. Uh, hepatitis associated with membranes. So NSAIDs are associated with minimal change disease, and every time you see a minimal change disease case in an adult, you have to suspect. Hodgkin's lymphoma or Hodgkin's disease. So think about that because in pediatric population, we don't even need to biopsy them. We just treat them with a little bit of prednisone and most kids get better. Or some kids are even so sensitive that they can develop um, minimal change after they get stung by a bee. I don't know if you guys heard about that, but you know, bee venom, it's a common offender in this pediatric minimal change disease. In an adult, it's a little bit different. The treatment is the same with steroids, but Sometimes patients are resistant to steroids. I have a couple, and I ended up having to give them, you know, like immunosuppression, cytoxin, and all that stuff. But um, yeah, so that's another form of damage to the kidneys from NSAIDs, and it can also cause membranous, secondary membranous glomerulonephritis. So you can tell that the kidneys, nephrologies, and NSAIDs we don't get along right. And I use NSAIDs all the time in the urgent care and my injured care work but I want you to identify who's a good candidate, who's not a good candidate. They're contraindicated in pregnancy, you guys know that? Mm -hmm. Because they can, they can cause the ductus arteriosus, they can shut it down, you know, that'll be a disaster before the baby's born. So that's, that's another contraindication, but yeah. If you use them, I use them and I've used them, but make sure you know your limitations and who to use them, you know, who shouldn't be getting them. Okay, so, Okay, before we jump into intrinsic, so we talk about NSAIDs being a common cause of uh, hypertension, kidney injury, and uh, what other things, what other things people do to themselves that can cause kidney failure? Mm. Dehydration maybe, I severe dehydration. Severe dehydration, but what else? Like in terms of things that they do to themselves, how do you get severely dehydrated? Alcohol. Alcohol. Mm -hmm. So alcohol use definitely. So what are the recreational stuff that can really mess up your kidneys? Narcotics. Uh, narcotics. You know, narcotics. Believe it or not, narcotics is the most common cause of uh, adults between the age of 18 to 55 in the United States. I don't know if you guys read the paper. So that's another problematic that you need to be able to address. And I want to. I want to give you advice you got to be firm. you got to be firm because you're going to get a lot of opiate seeking. In the state of California, I don't know if it applies in Indiana, in the state of California, we have a database. It's called the Cures Database. You, you too? Okay. Okay, so it is a huge problem nationwide. And it's, it's provider-created. I mean, it's just psychiatrogenic, period. So what happened is that when in the 1990s, when they started like having all these outcomes on NSAIDs, before you guys were even in school, there was a medicine called Biox, and there was another NSAID, I can't forget what, what it's called, Valdecoxif, and the only one that survived, the only COX-2 selected that survived this, this era is Celebrex, still in the market. So those guys from Biox, they settled because a lot of patients ended up having strokes and heart attacks and died as a result of using it. So doctors, they started getting scared and away from NSAIDs, and they started using more and more opiates. And I'm gonna give you a tip of advice. You know, there's a conversion, opiate conversion tables. Mm -hmm. Are you guys familiar yeah. with those? Okay, so. Morphine equivalent. Exactly, so one of the features of, 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 of opiates is that you develop tolerance. Tolerance means that you need a higher dose to develop the same effect, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the definition of tolerance. So when you've been on opiates for some time, they become, the doses become higher and higher and higher. So what research has shown is that 
there is no no way to substantiate or defend yourself if you exceed the equivalent of 100 milligrams of morphine per day even if your patient comes to you telling you like this is my requirements you can review my prescriptions i'm going to tell you there is you got to be very firm because the opiate seeking people you're so afraid of like patient satisfaction or the scores is going to affect mm -hmm. my performance and everything but you've worked very hard to get to this point and it will be very sad to get a lawsuit or to lose your job or lose your license for for not defending what you're supposed to be doing in the state of California, I don't know if you guys heard in the news, there was a doctor in, I think she was in Palmdale. She, she was famous even across the borders from the state of California, kids were actually traveling. She had a sliding scale of how much to charge. And the patients would go in like, okay, you want Norco? Or you want Oxycontin? Or you want fentanyl? Or what do you want, Dilaudid? So she had a scale, a sliding scale, and she would charge like for every prescription, eighty dollars or seventy dollars, and she had like she was she was basically prosecuted and found guilty for the death of two guys, two boys from Arizona that they drove in and they were just seeking narcotics, and she became the first physician in the United States to be convicted for prescri prescription irresponsible prescription of opiates. Mm -hmm. So it's all over the news. Mm -hmm. The most common cause of death from adults from the age of 18 to 55 is opiate overuse, prescription opiate overuse. You hear all the time, Michael Jackson, Prince, you name it. All of these celebrities, they die from opiates. So you guys know, you need to know your, your rules. What I tell my patient, I'm gonna share what I do with you guys so you understand the patient may, may get upset. You need to tell them, number one, this is the number one cause of death. Mm -hmm. And it's, I'm sorry to say, but it's us, the prescribers, we created this problem. Number two, this is for your benefit. Whether they take it fine or not, you need to tell them. And number three, my organization set very specific rules in how many pills you can give someone that comes in for acute pain management. Why? Because if you really have a lot of pain, you need to reach out to your primary doctor or you need to have a pain contract. Have you guys heard about pain contracts? Okay, or you need to go to your pain management doctor. So I cannot give more than three days worth of opiates. And that made it very easy for me because when they come, that, that rule in itself eliminated all these drug seekers from the urgent care because they got sick of it. Every time they go and we were all on the same page mm -hmm. and they were coming and then good luck. It's not worth your time. Not worth your time, exactly. But mm -hmm. two tips. Now they come in, you need to know this, as an urgent care. They come with dental pain. Mm -hmm. How do you assess for that? To go to a dentist, yeah. No, but how do you assess like truly there is pain or not? If you see an abscess, it's obviously you, you, you know like, boy, that's extremely painful, right? Mm -hmm. How do you assess for dental pain? So they know, so that's one thing. And the other thing is that they register, let's say that your shift ends at 10 p.m. Mm -hmm. The last patient is at 9.30. They register exactly at 9.30. Why? Because they know you've been working for 12 hours, that you're fed up, and you're more likely to say, you know, what do you want? Okay, out of my way, right? Mm -hmm. That's what most doctors do, they, they do the easy path, because it's very painful. It's like having a conversation with someone that you know for a fact they have a viral disease, and they're insisting that they have an antibiotic. How many times, and I include myself, it just goes so exhausting, like, you know what, just, just go it. take it, exactly. Mm -hmm. That's exactly the, the kind of like, doesn't come. That's exactly the kind of like uh, the kind of stuff that. You, oh my! I'm sorry. Can you pause it for a second? I'm gonna get some water. And just get some water. So yeah, so we were talking about the uh, things people do to themselves in terms of like before we move into intrinsic diseases of the kidney. Mm -hmm. So other things that we see, um, cocaine. Cocaine use is, uh, causes a ischemic ATN, decreases renal perfusion. And um, on your boards, on your medical boards, I don't know if they, they still have that question, but there is an increasing increased recognition of um, uh, tainted cocaine with uh, levamisole, which is an antiparasitic medication that they use in developing countries. And that can cause like a severe form of vasculitis. These patients get like a 
anchor positive and ANA positive vasculitis with uh, a lot of like uh, digit and distal tissue ischemia. Yeah, actually I wrote a case report with one of my friends, a patient, a lady that came to all of you with her nose fell off completely. Then it was completely fell off. She was snorting it. And um, yeah, but sub polysubstance abuse and drug use is, kidneys are very sensitive organs. It's not, it doesn't last long, especially if you have used them, you're going to renal failure very easily. Okay, so going back to the kidneys, so the same gentleman, we already rule out <coughs> pre-renal. Mm -hmm. We cover all the, you know, like, I didn't tell you he was hypotensive, but later I'm going to tell you that he was hypotensive. And we actually rule out post-obstructive. And before I move on, post-obstructive, you need to do an ultrasound of the kidneys. Looking for what? Uh, Hydronephrosis. Hydro so simple question, rule out hydronephrosis. Anybody can read that ultrasound, it's very easy. Okay, so intrinsic diseases of the kidney. So what do you guys know? You guys know which one is the most common intrinsic disease of the kidney? Start with an A. So ATN. Okay. Which one is the second most common cause? Okay. ATN. Okay. Which one is the third most common cause? Okay. ATN. ATN. So that that's the take home message. That's why I'm doing it this way so you guys always remember. It's ATN. ATN in the kidney is like a symptom. It's like if you come to me and you tell me I have a fever and I'm gonna say fever from what? So the same thing happens in the kidney when you when you suspect ATN or you actually see the microscopic findings of the urine. You look what do you see when you when you look at the urine in ATN? Is that brown? brown? Muddy brown. Muddy brown, brown, brown crystals. And it's uh, you're never gonna forget it. You see it once. You know, make sure you actually look at pictures of muddy brown crystals because you're gonna get a question on your boards with ATN. So when I see ATN, I even I stop spinning down the urine and looking in the microscope because when I look at the urine, I see a lot of ATN. I mean, just just by looking at the fully, and you see all that residue that is pretty dark mm -hmm. in the bag. The urine looks like hematuria, but it's not really hematuria. It's just like mud. You know, those are like all the the tubular cells that are slough enough. They're death from ischemia, from decreased renal perfusion, and it goes into into the bag, and that's why it looks muddy brown. Um, but you have to understand that this ATN is just a manifestation of something else. And I'm gonna give you some examples so you understand what I'm saying. We, earlier today, we talked about pigment induced AKI mm -hmm. causing ATN. Um, but we also have, for instance, contrast induced nephropathy. Have you guys heard about that entity? Mm -hmm. Contrast induced nephropathy. So which patients are at risk of developing contrast induced nephropathy? Low GFR. Low GFR. What else? That's a good, good one. Increased renal function is a risk factor for developing acute kidney injury related to contrast. What else? Allergy to it. Some people are allergic to it. But that's you can you cannot predict that. If I have a patient, there's three things that I can predict them. If you're a diabetic mm -hmm. with kidney disease, your chances are pretty high. Mm -hmm. If you have advanced age, your chances are high of developing contrast-induced nephropathy. Or if you have a condition called multiple myeloma. Mm -hmm. Multiple myeloma in itself is like a whole a whole like chapter in nephrology mm -hmm. because it's very toxic to the kidneys. Multiple myeloma itself can injure the kidney like in five or six different ways. I'm gonna mention some of them. You can develop hypercalcemia induced renal failure. You can develop acute interstitial nephritis from multiple myeloma. You can develop uh, amyloidosis from multiple myeloma. Um, you can develop um, ATN because the, the physiopathology is that your B cells are producing like this monoclonal type of um, antibody, like the Benz Jones proteins. And the Benz Jones protein actually um, sticks to, there is a protein in the, in the loop of Henley, it's called the, the, the horse, tan, tan horse fold protein. 
which is a, like a muco mucolipoprotein. I think it's, it just confers like some, some immunoglobulin um, functions for the kidneys. So the Benz Jones adheres to this and makes, forms a very insoluble matrix. And these patients, they have an ischemic form of ATN. And if you give them contrast, 100% guaranteed that the patient is gonna go into renal failure. Most of the times they, they don't recover because they already have like a trouble with solubility. The kidneys, and that's management of myeloma, myeloma kidney. There's an entity called myeloma kidney, which is the actual Benz Jones protein is like completely clogging the tubules. You need to blast these patients with lots of fluids. If they're an oliguric and aneuric, you really have no choice, you need to dialyze them. But I'm just saying to prevent the advanced phases of the disease, you need to blast them with a lot of fluid. And myeloma can also cause um, um, uh, toxicity directly related to a, to a kidney. And there's an entity called light chain deposition disease and heavy change deposition disease. So it's a very toxic condition. And a lot of the times the outcomes on myeloma depend on how early you diagnose and you start treating the condition. Because once they, they, you go into renal failure, your prognosis is completely different if you have multiple myeloma. So, and I deal all the time with multiple myeloma in my profession because it's, it's a favorite organ. Um, but those are the, the four major categories for contrast-induced nephropathy. Diabetics, decreased GFR, advanced age, and multiple myeloma. Like you can probably say, you can pass, you can probably say like, if you don't absolutely have to give contrast, please stay away from it. The reason being is that if you get an MI and you have, let's say, GFR of 25 and you're a diabetic and you come to Tarzana, Dr. Benzer goes in, immediately he assesses the patient, he calls me, hey, you know what? This guy needs an angiogram because I think he has an LAD lesion. I'm gonna tell him, go for it, go for it. It is what it is. You need to tell the patient and the family that there is a risk of contrast induced nephropathy. And we have some strategies that have been implemented to minimize the risk, such as hydration pre and post contrast exposure. If the patients don't have congestive heart failure, you give him IV fluids, it's probably like one ml per kilogram per hour, like for eight hours. So like 80 to 100 cc's four hours before and after. We use mucomist. I don't know if you guys heard about mucomist. So mucomist is uh, acetyl cysteine. Some studies say that that doesn't work. I still do it because there is no harm and there is this questionable benefit. And it's a very cheap and harmless intervention. So I recommend it to my patients. Um, and another thing that they may trick you on your boards is that they will present you with a case of a patient who is in florid heart failure. Like all the signs and symptoms of left heart failure, right? And then, or right heart failure. And then they tell you what is the best next step in the management to protect these patient's kidneys. They're gonna give you A, give them IV fluids. B, give them um, um, IV furosemide. C, don't give contrast. And they're talking about like a life in that situation. D, whatever. So they wanna, because you heard like, oh, I, I remember the doctor said that saline is actually good for these patients. But that's the wrong answer because the, the right answer is to diurese the patient to optimize the hemodynamics. Because remember, it's the same concept that I've been telling you. If your pump function is not good, your kidney function is not gonna be good. And a lot of the times when you see a patient this week, when you're presenting a patient to Dr. Benzer, ask him if, if he thinks this patient has cardiorenal syndrome. And one of the characteristics of cardiorenal syndrome is that the urine sediment, it looks pretty bland. You guys know what I mean by bland? Um, you're not referring to specific gravity, something different. Hmm? No, I'm referring to the fact that as a nephrologist, and this is a, when I have a problem with students when they come presenting cases to me, if you get a renal consult, if you're going to present a renal patient, imagine if you're presenting a, a cardiac patient to your cardiac attending without an EKG. You wouldn't even think about it. You're like, oh, where's that paper? I need, to, I need to get this paper so I can show it to the attending, right? So the same thing happens in nephrology. A lot of times they come presenting patients to me 
and they don't even give me a UA. Mm -hmm. That's where the money is, right? By looking at the urine sediment, I know if there is inflammation, if there is proteinuria, if there is RBCs. You know, a lot of the times the technicians are the one doing the microscopic, and a lot of the times they're not well trained to recognize such a things such as um, red blood cell cast, which is pretty it's pretty abnormal to have a red blood cell cast. It's almost pathognomonic <coughs> of it's pathognomonic of glomerular hematuria, like the the damage is coming from the kidney, it's not from the urinary tract. And but all the time I get I get a case and. And at the end of the student telling me everything for five minutes, I turned like, where is the UA? Like, oh, yeah, okay, you, would you present a case to a cardiologist with any case? Yeah, I always tease them. But remember, you always look at the urine. So patients with cardiorenal syndrome, they have a very bland urine. No proteinuria or minimal proteinuria, and they don't have red blood cells or down disease. Whereas a patient with an intrinsic renal disease, they have a lot of stuff. I'm going to talk about it in a minute. But, yeah, so, so we talk about contrast, we talk about rhabdo, what else could be going wrong? So we talk about this guy, he went to surgery, he got an antibiotic, like for antibiotic prophylaxis, right? Everybody gets a little bit of uh, NANSEV or, what's the name of that stuff? Cephazolin. Cephazolin IV. Um, before the surgery. So... Acute interstitial nephritis. Is it common or is it not common? Or what do you guys think? I already told you the four more common causes, right? Mm -hmm. Think interstitial nephritis is common? Mm -hmm. Fortunately, it isn't. And it only accounts for about 3% of, 3 to 5% of the cases of acute kidney injury mm -hmm. in the hospitalized patient. The important thing, and I think why, why they keep asking questions to students on the boards, is that recognizing these entities is imperative. Because it is an allergic form of disease. It's, it's not the glomeruli, it's not the, it's not the tubules, it's actually the interstitium that gets um, inflamed. There is like significant migration of inflammatory cells and release of cy inflammatory cytokines and destruction of the, you know, interstitium following, you know, following with the glomeruli, which is the functional unit of the kidney. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, is a, if you, you guys remember the hypersensitivity reactions when you were doing your immunology? So there is like a type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4. So this is a cell-mediated inflammation, I think it's a type 4. You need to know this for your step 1, I think. Uh, so it's like a it's type 4 um, cell-mediated reaction. So what happens is that your body gets exposed to an antigen and your body will recognize that antigen. So the first time that interstitial nephritis happens, it doesn't happen that quickly because let's say that you're, you're heavily allergic to penicillin. Mm -hmm. And I'm giving you, not because you're developing anaphylaxis, it's just because you develop interstitial nephritis. The first time you took it, took you a few days and then the doctor, the doctor told you, oh, you know what, you have a rash, you may want to stop that. And that's another advice. If you have a patient with a rash coming to, to the urgent care related to an antibiotic, you need to stop it. The other day, a doctor, uh, the patient had two more days of amoxicillin, mm -hmm. and the doctor was a rash, and the doctor advised the patient, finish it up. Next thing, the patient came in with renal failure from interstitial nephritis. So rash is one of the manifestations of this disease. I'm going to talk about it. But... The second time that you get exposed to the penicillin, you already have a preformed response. There's a whole army waiting for that penicillin, darn penicillin to, to come into your system. And these patients, they immediately start having the inflammation in the kidneys. So one of the hallmarks of the disease is not, it's not on every patient. And you have to analyze this test with a grain of salt. But on the board, they may give you urine eosinophils. Remember that? Mm -hmm. So 50% of the patients with acute interstitial nephritis can have urine eosinophils, but what I want you guys to remember is that urine eosinophils is not pathognomonic of interstitial nephritis. For the boards, probably it is, because the boards are pretty straightforward. The boards don't give you gray. It's either black or white. So 
urine eosinophils can actually be seen in patients with active glomerulonephritis. It can be seen in patients with, let's say you have pyuria from uh, pyelonephritis or a severe urinary tract infection. Or you can even see that when someone has prostatitis because there is pyuria. So, but in the boys, if they give you, like, let's say a patient that was given a, a typical offending drug, what are the offending drugs for AIN? Yes, remember? I already told you a group, the beta lactans. Mm -hmm. what, what other groups? What are the bigger offenders for AIN? I mean, the list is this long. Yeah. And if you look on your Hippocrates, probably <laughs> every drug can, can actually cause it. But for the boys, you need to know at least three or four categories. You guys know which one? Beta lactams, what else? Cipro, was like fluoro fluoroquinolones can actually cause AIN. Um, PPIs is actually one of the biggest offenders. PPIs. And some of the psychotropic medications, but if you remember those three, I'm happy. You're not gonna get it wrong in your boards. Beta lactams, fluoroquinolones, and PPIs, okay? So the diagnosis is basically, you look at a case, the patient has an active urine sediment, by that I mean hematuria, pyuria, sterile pyuria. A lot of the times the patients, they start getting treated for, for UTI. And that's why another tip of advice, you guys are going to be working in the urgent care. Always look at the prior urine culture results. Because you're going to see a lot of patients going to the urgent care for antibiotics and they never really had not even one documented urinary tract infection. Mm -hmm. So those patients either they have some sort of cystitis or they need to get a cystoscopy or see a urologist because they may have interstitial cystitis or they may have even acute interstitial nephritis and they have pyuria because you can develop chronic interstitial nephritis. There's an entity called chronic granulomatous interstitial nephritis Oh, NSAIDs is the other one. Remember we talked about? So those four, you need to remember those four. Penicillins, Cipro, fluoroquinolones, NSAIDs, and PPIs. Prune pump inhibitors. And so, and the patients ultimately, they didn't have any UTI, and then the next thing they know, I'm gonna tell you this, my, I love my grandmother because, because of poor medical care. She kept going to the doctor because she had a lower urinary tract symptoms, Every time he would see her, the guy would give her an antibiotic. <clears throat> he, didn't, he didn't bother to look at the urine cultures or even do a urine culture hmm. ever. Or when I went back and reviewed the case, all the urine cultures were negative for infection. And the guy like treated her for years. By the time I was able to get her to get a cystoscopy, she already had invasive bladder carcinoma and she died within six months. So you have to think about, that's another common mistake. Um, prescribing antibiotics for UTIs when the patients actually don't have an UTI. So if you work in the same place where everything is integrated, you can easily, with one click, you can look at the previous cultures and you can make a decision. If the urine cultures are all negative, my advice to you, refer to urology because those patients need a cystoscopy. Okay? Okay. Let me think about it. So, so on your boards, they... They have acute or subacute renal failure with pyuria and positive urine eosinophils with one of the common offending drugs. Very straightforward. They're not going to give you like a zebra. Very straightforward. Another thing you should think about when you see a symptomatic, I'm sorry, aseptic pyuria. Aseptic pyuria means that the patient has WBCs but the cultures are negative. What else do you think about? Which entity can give you aseptic pyuria? You guys probably don't see that in Indiana, but we see it here all the time in California because we have a lot of uh, immigration. Renal TV. <coughs> Renal TV. And you probably see that you probably saw that a lot in your practice too because, yeah, in Colombia I saw a lot of tuberculosis when I was there. So, I, aseptic pyuria, you think about, you need to do a urine AFP on these patients. Okay? But, for your boards, probably the most common scenario is aseptic pyuria, you think about AIN, okay? Very good, so we cover AIN, then, 
So we talk about ATN, which is basically the tubules. We talk about the interstitium. Now we can talk about the glomeruli itself. So that's probably like a 10 hour talk, but I'm gonna give you everything in a nutshell. I always tell the students that there is always something in every specialty, there is something always that we cannot miss, that we're, we, we're, not a, we're not allowed, we cannot afford to miss something. Maybe in surgery, I don't know, maybe in surgery is like don't miss the hemostasis or in cardiology is don't miss uh, LAD lesion. Let's say that you do a stress test and you've, you fail to recognize this patient had an LAD lesion because that's the widow maker, remember? That's how we call the artery, the LAD. In my field, the way I can get in trouble is when I missed something called an RPGN. Have you guys heard of an RPGN? It stands for Rapidly Progressive Lamellonephritis. Have you guys heard about that term? Okay, so RPGN is a syndrome it's not a diagnosis itself, it's just a syndrome that is characterized by very rapid progression and disruption of the glomeruli. If it goes unrecognized, the patients are going to be dialysis dependent within three months. Does that refer to like the crescent sign when they do biopsy? Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Very good, very good that you remember that. So, for me as a nephrologist, when I get a new consult, I need to understand the patient over time and that's when it makes it very useful when they bring papers from other doctors and I know what the kidney function looked like a year ago or two years ago because that's the only way I know the duration of the renal failure right but also I have to understand the how the urine looks like that's why I, I refuse to see a patient unless they have a UA because how am I gonna do it? what am I gonna say if I don't have a UA that's where the money is if I see a patient with no protein, no red blood cells, no white blood cells, my differential goes to a couple of things or three things. One, the patient had a really bad ATN at one point in their lives for whatever reason, either because you had like a really bad pyelonephritis or your kidneys didn't develop or you have renal hyperplasia or you have some sort of like damage throughout your life and whatever happened, happened and the inflammation subsided or I'm dealing with cardiorenal, which I already explained to you, the kidney is relatively okay, it's just a heart. Or I'm dealing with analgesic nephropathy. Have you guys heard about analgesic nephropathy? So analgesic nephropathy is NSAIDs. It's when patients take NSAIDs for a long time. When they stop using them, the inflammation subsides and the urine looks pretty normal. The damage is already done. Remember, the kidney does not regenerate like the liver liver regenerates, the kidney does not regenerate. So whenever you have an ischemic insult or an infectious insult or an obstructive insult, whatever it is, the kidney is replaced by scar tissue. And every time I see a new consult and I look at the numbers and I already know that the numbers are the same for the last year and I look at the UA and the UA looks normal, nothing to worry about. But if the urine doesn't look normal, you can't miss that. I can't miss an RPGN. So an RPGN, it's a, it's a, there are different entities. I'm going to mention um, the ones that are more commonly associated with an RPGN. So probably you guys heard a lot about lupus. Mm -hmm. You heard about lupus, so in lupus nephritis. Have you guys heard about lupus nephritis? So lupus can attack any organ pretty much. And the outcomes are more serious when there is either CNS involvement or when there is renal involvement. And I participate in the care of a lot of these patients because it's, it's a, it's when they have severe lupus, it's very common that they actually have lupus nephritis. So I don't think you need to know this for your level of training, but I'm going to men mention that the World Health Organization classifies lupus nephritis in six categories. For me, like the ones that I cannot afford to miss are three and four. Three and four, one is called focal proliferative glomerulonephritis. The other one is um, diffuse proliferative glomerulonephritis. And when I look in the microscope, every time you do a renal biopsy, the biopsy is sent for three, three components. One is called light microscopy, which that's where you see the crescent that you were mentioning. 
The second one is called immunofluorescence. That's when you see the antibody deposition. So they stain for different for different types of like immune um, Im 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 immunologic diseases like ANCA. Have you guys heard about ANCA? Mm -hmm. ANCA, ANCA associated vasculitis. <coughs> And the last one is the electron microscopy. That's when they actually look for ultra-structural abnormalities like effacement of the polycytes that we see in minimal change disease. Do you guys, do you guys know what we call Nils disease? Have you guys heard about Nils disease? Nils disease is the same as minimal change disease. But do you guys know why we call it Nils disease? Nil stands for nothing in light microscopy. It's cool, right? So you look and that way you're never going to forget it. You look at the light microscopy, it's completely normal. You look at the electron microscopy and you see all the polycyte effacement. And that's why you make the diagnosis. So when you have a patient, the light microscopy comes within days of doing a renal biopsy. The electron microscopy takes about two weeks. So when the pathologist call me on day three, hey, your patient's glomeruli, they look perfect. And a patient has massive proteinuria or nephrotic range proteinuria, I, pr I pretty much, I'm pretty sure that I'm dealing with minimal change. Okay, so, so they do those three components, right? And every component is useful to give us information about what's in there. But for a crescentic glomerulonephritis, that's pretty, it's actually the worst thing that you can have in the kidneys. It doesn't mean that you're going to go into renal failure, but we need to act promptly. So whenever the, the pathologist, the renal pathologist call me, hey, I see a lot of crescents, I get like, wow, this patient needs to come in right away. Sometimes I need to admit them and I need to give them pulse dose solumedrol or I need to give them cytoxin, whatever the case is, and I need to do a lot of coordination of care because I need to get involved, I need to get the rheumatologist involved or the neurologist, whatever other organ is involved in the patient so we can make, you know, joint decisions. But uh, lupus is actually one of the big categories. There are other categories of lupus. There is like lupus minimally involved in the kidneys. We don't treat those patients with immunosuppression. We just observe, observe them over time because one of the characteristics of lupus in the kidney, it can mutate. So you can jump from lupus class one to lupus class four. And the only way you can predict those things is by seeing the patients periodically by assessing renal function and UA renal function in UA and whenever they're changing something's changing I need to do another biopsy so this is an ongoing situation with these patients it's not like you're out of the woods yeah you can be out of the woods when you get treated but they need to be monitored at least my lupus patients that I already successfully treated them I see them twice a year just to keep a close eye on them okay so we have um, lupus is one of the big categories and then we have the ANCA vasculitis. Do you guys remember about ANCA? Do you guys know anything about ANCA? I always forget which one is associated with um, like the... So there's ANCA, PIANCA, and a couple of the other ones. The CIANCA and the PIANCA, right? So ANCA is it's, it's just uh, the big category. So when we talk about vasculitis, you know, I have a slide here, so we... What mirrors the mirrors? It's actually a pretty useful talk. I you guys should read it because it covers everything you need to know, and it's like bored. Okay, so if you take a look at this thing, let me use the something to point. Okay, if you look at the vasculitis, we have a small vessel vasculitis, medium vessel the large vessels. So the large vessels, simple. Somebody comes into the urgent care with decreased vision, you need to think, suspect temporal arteritis, right? So these patients, they need a temporal artery biopsy. You can't miss that. That's probably the most common question you're gonna get on your boards. Have I seen that in my career? Only once. You don't wanna be like blamed for that, right? So polymyalgia, polymyalgia rheumatica, it's very common and it's commonly tested on your boards. So these are individuals that they complain about severe pain in the proximal muscles, primarily on the thighs and the, and the shoulders and the, and the arms. And 
they ma made it clear to you that they, they've never experienced anything like that, they have a lot of stiffness and a lot of pain, you give them 60 milligrams of prednisone, the next day they think you're the best doctor in the world. So that's a classic characteristic of PMR. They respond very quickly to prednisone. And Takayasu's, um, I think um, this is like, you get like a dissecting aortic aneurysm, I've never seen this. And then medium vessel, if you're gonna be, end up taking care of kids, you need to know about this disease. I don't take care of kids, but these kids can actually present with uh, a lot of conjunctivitis. They can have like a fever that doesn't go away. I think like fever like for more than five or six days. And they, they can have ulcerations in the mouth. And why is this important? Because these kids, if they're not treated, they can develop coronary aneurysms and they can die. So this, this is a nasty disease in pediatrics. Every pediatrician that I've met, when they do workup for fever that doesn't go away, they always think about this because I've never seen it personally, but I, I know you're gonna get a question like this on your board, so make sure you remember about this one. Then we have polyarthritis nodosum. What is the systemic disease association of PAN? Oh, systemic, is that the aneurysm? But which viral disease is associated with PAN? Vlad, do you remember for your boards? Hepatitis B. Hepatitis B, so always remember, every single polyarthritis nodosum. So how do you do the diagnosis of PAN? If they show you an angiogram of the kidneys and they show you these microaneurysms in the arteries of the kidney, that's PAN. So they may show you a picture. I have never done an angiogram of the kidney just to diagnose this condition and this is a rare condition, but you don't biopsy these patients because if you're so unlucky that you end up hitting one of those aneurysms, the patients are gonna bleed to death. So PAN associated with hepatitis B, okay? So, and then we have the small vessels, and this is what I'm gonna be talking about because that's what we're dealing with the kidneys. So we have the ANCA positive. ANCA stands for anti-nuclear anti -nuclear cytoplasmic antibodies. And there is actually ANCA positive and ANCA negative diseases. For, for practical purposes, you know, have you guys heard about um, Henoschollin purpura? Okay, so this is, this is what's ANCA negative is either you have the Henneschel and purpura, lupus, or drugs like I was just telling you about this cocaine that is tainted with, with levamisole, or leukocytoplastic vasculitis. So in these patients, they may give you, I think the, the HSP, they give you a description of the, it's like a salmon-like rash in the lower extremities. Um, for the leukocytoplastic vasculitis, it's actually a, a, purpura, a purpura that's actually palpable. If they tell you the word palpable purpura, you're, you're immediately you start thinking about this category on your boards. It's like palpable purpura, I always remember that. And then ANCA positive, we have, we have um, three conditions and there is drug induced, remember I was telling you about the cocaine. So, but the, the, the three more commons, this, this is the old terminology. We don't call it, we don't call it uh, Wegener's, we don't call it, um, church straws because Wegener, I think these two guys were Nazis, like the ones that described these entities. So Wegener's is now called granulomatosis with polyangitis, GPA, that's how we call it. And I want to share with you, this is useful information for you guys. I saw a 32 year old male at the urgent care that he was having sinus issues for six months. And he came under my care just like a regular 10 minute encounter in the urgent care. The guy was treated with multiple rounds of antibiotics. So I did a CT of the sinuses. Mm -hmm. He had like pan sinusitis in one side completely. I mean, you wouldn't see that in a patient with, that's taking like hardcore stuff like Unisin and they gave him like uh, Augmentin and Levaquin and Prednisone and he kept coming to the urgent care and I told him like, this is, there's something really wrong. So if you have an adult with otitis, severe otitis, recurrent episodes, send an ANCA. You're gonna impress the attendant because you know, even, even I called that day, I called the ENT attendant, I told her, hey, I have this dude with, with ANCA, you know, I'm sorry, with uh, pansinusitis. Not even the attendant told me to do an ANCA. And I told the guy, you know, I wanna do an ANCA because I wanna make sure you're, you don't have an autoimmune problem. And it turns out that this guy is already being taken care of by a rheumatologist. I, I called him last week and said, how are you doing? Like, oh, thank you very much for diagnosing me. I have ANCA and I didn't even know. So these patients, they get, I know this because a lot of these patients, they come under my care when the kidneys are gone. 
taking an RPGN. They, they misdiagnosed them, they gave them multiple antibiotics and they end up going into renal failure. Very easy to screen, you just send an ANCA. So the MPA, it's the um, um, uh, microscopic polyangitis. So Wegener's patients can get otitis, sinusitis, lung and kidneys, okay? MPA can actually get lungs and kidneys, primarily lungs, MPA. Short straws, these patients have peripheral eosinophilia and they have, you know, and wh what classifies these diseases is, it's just like a very unclear field in medicine, but what we do is like, if you have an ANCA positive, then the test goes to the second phase, which is the immunofluorescence. So what, and they, they, they call it a C ANCA or a P ANCA, depending on the pattern on immunofluorescence. So if the pattern is cytoplasmic, they call it Cianca. If the pattern is perinuclear, they call it Pianca. And we know that statistically speaking, if you have Cianca, you're more likely to have Wegener's. If you have Pianca, you're more likely to have MPA. So the easy way to remember is there is a P for the Pianca. So the microscopic meningitis, I mean, it's just like a little tip to remember. But you can see an overlap. You can see Cianca and presenting as, as short straws and vice versa. But statistically speaking, most patients with Wegener's, they have a CIANC. And f on your practice, if you see an adult, if you get recurring otitis, you either you're a smoker or you have structural abnormalities of your canal or some sort of like structural abnormality or immunodeficiency or something, or you have ANC. And I've seen this a lot of times, you know, because I take care of a lot of these patients and I need to give them chemotherapy and I need, when they present in full-blown renal failure, I need to do plasmapheresis. Have you guys heard about plasmapheresis? Plasma exchange, I need to remove the, the plasma, the body plasma and replace it with normal albumin or normal, you know, FFPs for those patients that are presenting with severe disease. So, always remember that. So that's the other big category of, um, <coughs> move the camera. So that's the other big category for um, RPGN. So I already told you guys about lupus and I already told you about ANCA. And I'm gonna tell you about another condition that is called, have you guys heard about good pastures? Okay. So good pastures disease, um, I think that's the name of the doctor. I think, I think that one we still call it good pasture. I don't know if he was a good doctor or not, but yeah. So we still call it good pastures disease and that's, that, the description, the original description are for those patients that actually presented with lung and kidney involvement. That's what we call pulmonary renal syndromes. Have you guys heard about that word? So there is few entities that can actually present with lung and kidneys, such as lupus, ANCAS, and good pastures. So good pastures, it's, a auto, it's, an, it's an autoimmune disorder because your body ends up developing antibodies, autoantibodies against the glomerular basement membrane. And that's the test of choice. So on your boards, when they tell you what is the test, what is the likely test of choice, an anti-GBM, anti-glomerular basement membrane. But you can also have anti-GBM nephropathy, which is a limited form of good pastures, but limited to the kidneys only, without lung involvement. So every time I get a patient with like rapidly declining creatinine, I do this test. And if they test positive, you know, you guys know what the management is? Uh, plasma freezes and you know like like a lot of the times I got it wrong on my board I remember I was so upset <laughs> because if you have a, either a TTP you know a thrombotic you know thrombocytopenic purpura um, or if you got an GBM the management we all know that you de you give them prednisone and all that stuff but the management is plasma freezes so make sure you don't miss that and then this disease, the good pastures, it can happen in, in mostly in males, believe it or not. It's a little more predominant, it's like two to one in males, but it has like a bimodal presentation. Either it happened in younger males or it happened in people after the age of 60. You know, it's rare to see somebody in the mi middle of their life developing this, either younger or the, the, the young or the old developing this condition. We don't know what causes it, but the treatment is steroids, plasmapheresis, and if you catch them early enough, you really make a difference for these patients. If you miss the early diagnosis, 
three months are gone. <coughs> okay, so that's the other, the other component of the. So we have the ANCA, anti-GBM, lupus, and there is a condition called IgA nephropathy. Have you guys heard of IgA nephropathy? So IgA nephropathy by far is the most common glomerular nephritis in the world. It's actually more commonly seen in two ethnic groups. It's commonly seen in Southeast Asians, like Filipinos and you know Indonesia and more like Southeast Asia. And the other and the other um, condition, the other um, ethnic group is uh, Hispanics. Actually, th this patient, most of these patients, they go unrecognized because a lot fortunately fortunately a lot of a lot of these patients they have a little bit of blood in the urine and they come under my care or under your urology care because they do they do a screening to buy life insurance or disability insurance and they see that they see microscopic hematuria when they see microscopic hematuria they're turned down so they send it to me and then the first thing i do is i usually do a 24-hour urine collection because I wanna, I wanna assess the amount of proteinuria excretion. So in the in other countries, mostly in Japan, everybody with microscopic hematuria they get a renal biopsy. Here we know that there's no use for doing that because number one, do you guys think a renal biopsy is safe? No, it isn't. It's quite invasive, actually. The, the kidneys are heavily vascularized. Mm -hmm. And one of the UCLA Harbor attendants, she stopped biopsying patients because she killed two patients with renal biopsy. So, and what are the contraindications for renal biopsy, by the way? You guys know? You guys know? Okay. You never, yeah, you never biopsy somebody who is uncontrolled hypertension because that's a guaranteed bleed. So patients need to have like good control of hypertension for at least, at least a week or two. Number two, you need to stop blood thinners. If they're on Plavix, Aspirin, Coumadin, you need to stop that. Number three, the most important question when I'm confronted with the question about doing a biopsy, I don't care what kind of disease you have. The question that I wanna ask myself, is this person a candidate for treatment? If I find out that they have X or Y nephropathy, am I going to give immunosuppression to this patient? So if I have a patient with multiple medical problems, debilitated, or in chemotherapy, and you know for a fact that if you end up hitting this person with immunosuppression, they're not going to make it, why am I going to do a biopsy? Or if I have a patient who is like non-adherent, homeless, and you know that, or hasn't, let's say it has an osteomyelitis that is not healing, why am I going to biopsy the patient? I can't give immunosuppression to someone with an unhealed ulcer. That's a contraindication to give immunosuppression. So, to me, it's clear that I need to make a decision not only to establish a diagnosis, which is the least, the least important thing for me, it's like, what am I going to do with that information? So, if I measure the 24-hour urine protein, and these persons already have, like, let's say, that one, less than 1,000, which is, you know, Less than 1,000 in nephrology is basically, it's, a, it's acceptable because that's something that we can try to manage with A's or ARB's, okay. A's inhibitors. I don't need to biopsy this patient. But if I have a patient with abnormal renal function, bunch of red blood cells, and I see a lot of protein in the urine, and the patient is healthy enough to undergo chemo or immunosuppression, for sure I'm gonna biopsy the person because those are the patients that I don't wanna miss. So IgA nephropathy, Fortunately, is indolent, asymptomatic, and goes unrecognized most of the times. There are some patients that they develop high features for progression because they already have like, like renal function loss over the years, and they may end up developing dialysis dependence. And there is a very small percentage of patients that they can actually go into RPGN. But the take-home message is not common, but I want you to remember, I mentioned about these diseases, IgA nephropathy is there, but it's not common. And you see a lot of IgA deposition and you see a lot of like crescents. When the pathology is just crescent, it's like fibrin and inflammation in the glomeruli causing active inflammation and destruction. That's why we need to move really fast with these patients to try to save those kidneys. Okay. 
I would say probably those are the most common RPGNs. We talk about AIN, we talked about ATN, and then we have the other glomerular nephritis. Remember there is a classification that involves nephritic and nephrotic, right? Do you guys know the difference between them? How much protein? 3 to 3.5, I think. Yeah. And do you think that's why do we talk about why do we talk about like one 3.5 versus less than 3.5? I made that question to my attendant and he was like I don't know. He went and researched it and apparently some British British doctor back in the days he came up with these numbers but the reality is not it's not useful, it's more like for educational purposes because we know that patients with nephritic syndrome they have other characteristics including hypertension and higher risk for destruction and progression of the kidneys versus patients with nephrotic they have mostly proteinuria, a lot of proteinuria and they're more likely to become um, predisposed to volume, volume expansion and edema so do you guys remember, let's talk about first about the nephrotics. Do you guys remember which conditions or which intrinsic diseases of the kidney are associated with a nephrotic syndrome picture? Remember, nephrotic syndrome is like a syndrome. It's like, I have a fever, from what? Same thing, RPGN is just a syndrome and it has different possibilities. Do you guys remember which conditions are more, mostly associated with nephrotic syndrome? Which one is the most common cause of kidney failure? Diabetes. diabetes. So diabetes is by far the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome, diabetic renal disease. Um, and these patients actually they end up developing um, um, very very can be fast or slow. But once they start like peeing massive amounts of proteinuria, that's when the, the patients are in trouble. And most of them, they end up dialysis dependent. So many years with new advancements in medicine, including finding a cure for hepatitis C, including finding all this immunotherapy, like President Jimmy Carter is still alive because of immunotherapy, and all the incredible advancements in oncology and everything. We still, to this date, we don't have anything effective to help these patients. And the National Kidney Foundation guideline still recommends hemoglobin A1C target of 7.0, systolic blood pressure goal in the 120s for those that are having proteinuria, um, avoidance of NSAIDs, and uh, you know to achieve normal tension, weight reduction, and that's it. That's all we have. There are like three drugs that are being studied and. One of the studies is coming next year, the other two are coming in 2019. And there's a lot of um, excitement in the nephrology community to, to, to see if we're able, finally able to find something to help these patients. But it's very sad because when they come to me, I already know they're going to be dialysis dependent. So every time I, in my first consult, when I see those patients, I try to be very honest because I wish my doctor would be honest with me if I have something that is going to progress to end stage renal failure. And because of that reason, some patients have, have felt that that really had no hope and they went to another nephrologist. That, that's not going to affect the way I practice because I think I much rather be honest with them and I tell them from the beginning, your kidneys are going south and I will try to do everything possible to help you slow down the progression. But there's so much we can do, especially if you come in and you're already peeing 10,000 10, milligrams of protein they have diabetic retinopathy, they have diabetic foot ulcers, diabetic neuropathy, erectile dysfunction, neurogenic bladder, so on and so forth. The horse has already left the barn. That's pretty much what happened. So, but I tell the patients, you know, we're going to try to do everything possible, but I also want to work with you in two aspects. Number one, you need to understand that eventually your disease is going to end up in kidney failure. For that reason, you need to make preparations either for dialysis or to get a transplant. For your boards, the most effective, the, mo this, the most effective way of helping patients with kidney failure is by doing a preemptive renal transplant. 
Do you guys know what preemptive means? Or they bypass dialysis. So the National Kidney Foundation, when the GFR is less than 30, we start talking about dialysis and we start doing transplant education. When the GFR is below 20, the patient should be already listed for transplant. You're gonna, you're gonna hear this shocking. In the state of California, the wait time for a disease donor is between eight to 11 years, mm. waiting on dialysis or waiting listed. You know, you can still get listed, but your GFR needs to be consistently below 20 before you get listed. But your chances are still very remote to get a transplant in the state of California and Indiana one of my patients was actually trying to get a kidney transplant there. The wait time in the University of Indiana was like six to eight, nine months, they told her. It was pretty crazy. I mean, the, the discrepancy was so, but you have to have money. You know, like Steve Jobs did, he didn't bypass the list, he played by the rules, but he had money to get listed in every transplant center in the country. Mm -hmm. So whenever a liver offer came, he just flew on his plane, and he, afford, he was able to afford to stay in a hotel for months and months and pay everything out of pocket. Most patients are not Steve Jobs, most patients they need to wait. And here in California, it's like whether your name is Barack Obama or Eduardo Lopez, you have to wait. You have to wait. So it's very frustrating for, for patients suffering from renal failure in the state of California. But when I see these patients in my office, I tell them, the best bet if you have a donor. And if you have a donor, we don't worry about ABO typing compatibility anymore because this, this person, I think he won, he won the Nobel Prize, the, the one that came up with this um, model of pairing donors all over the nation. Have you guys heard about the pair exchange programs? So that was Pioneer here in UCLA. So what they do is basically, it's a complex math mathematical algorithm where they actually match donors from all over the country with prospective recipients. And let's say that I'm, that let's say that you have renal failure and I'm your donor. We're not related, it's unlikely we're gonna have genetic like match. So we both go, we both get worked up. They tell us, you know, if you get a kidney from him, your chances are gonna be rejection. So why don't we do pair exchange? So you consent for pair exchange and when the time comes, I go to the OR and the other donor goes to the OR simultaneously and the kidneys are shipped acro across the country and the patients get transplanted the same day. Pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. It's pretty neat. I mean, the person who did that, I, he didn't even have a medical background. He had a background in economics, I think, and he just envisioned this like offer and demand and offer and he wrote the whole theory and he came up with this amazing and that's, that's really helping to bring down the numbers, but it still is gonna be it's a very dramatic situation for patients suffering from renal failure in the state of California. Um, for your boards, remember, preemptive transplant. Remember, that's the right answer for every patient suffering from renal failure. Okay, so diabetic renal disease is by far the most common one. On the, on the boards, they may show you the typical histopathologic lesion, which is called the Kimmelstein-Wilson nodules, they're like some fibrosis and they're like this uh, very highly intensely stained by hematoxylin. It's like a, just imagine like a red nodule in the biopsy. So the chemo still Wilson, but you only see that in advanced diabetic retinopathy. I'm sorry, di diabetic nephropathy. And it's a bad disease. Like, like if you're peeing 10 grams and your diabetes is well controlled and your blood pressure is well controlled, that's it. There's really very few things you can do. Give them an AZ inhibitor and just wait for get, to get a transplant. Okay, that's one. Um, the other common ones for the boards, you need to know about membranous, membranous nephropathy. So for, for blood, the systemic associations associated with membranous are mostly solid organ malignancies like breast, stomach, colon, Nephrologists, we diagnose cancer before other doctors because when I, when I get a renal biopsy and the pathologist tells me, you know, this is secondary membranous, I really need to figure it out, secondary to what? 
and the list is very long. I'm just going to mention some things. I already mentioned the solid organ malignancies, but you also see in drug-induced membranous like NSAIDs, captopril, which is an age inhibitor, has been associated with with uh, drug-induced membranous, plavix, ticlopidine, which is another antiplatelet agent. Um, there's a lot of infectious diseases associated with uh, with uh, membranous, including hepatitis B, including syphilis, including malaria, and I believe um, HIV as well. But if you see HIV, it's more likely to be associated with another type of membranous called FSGS. Have you guys heard about FSGS? Stands for focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. FSGS. So that's another type of um, membranous. But I'm gonna mention for the sake of time and for the sake of your, you know, the the chances of you getting questions. I want to mention a few things that are important that you guys know. Patients with membranous. Mem mem I'm sorry. Patients with nephrotic syndromes. What kind of clinical? Presentations. What kind of clinical complications develop? Do you guys remember? But they develop a lot of volume edema. Like that's why they need to be on a sodium and a fluid restricted diet. But what else? What happens when you're peeing a lot of protein? But what 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 happens to you? I mean, what what are the complications that these patients develop? If you're losing your proteins, what else are you losing in your proteins? And then what happens when the liver is like upregulating all these enzymes? So it's making less of like your clotting factors and all that will be part of it. You're losing protein C and protein S, which are the natural anticoagulants. So these patients are are prothrombotic. Okay. So one of the complications is that they can get like DVTs and PEs. Mm -hmm. So that's 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 common you know, commonly tested on your boards, like PE or like DVTs on these patients. So they also lose a lot of the immunoglobulins. It's not just albumin, what they're peeing, they're peeing a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And they are prone to infection with encapsulated organisms. So they develop uh, um, community acquired pneumonia with, with strep pneumonia and also with uh, Neisseria meningitis, which is another encapsulator. So you got to make sure that these patients get, you know, the Prevnar 13 and the Pneumovax and the and the meningitis vaccine because they do develop. It's like a patient with no spleen, pretty much. I think about the encapsulated organisms, um, and they also develop accelerated atherosclerosis, which is a big deal, big deal, big deal for these patients because when the production of albumin is upregulated in the liver, the production of all these LDL molecules is also increased. So these patients, they come, they come under my care with LDLs of 400 and 500, it becomes very challenging. Now with the new drugs that we have, you know, these new monoclonal antibodies that, has to, how do they call the P, Repata, and they, there's like a... Oh, PSK9? Yeah, the PSK9. So before, you know, when I was in medical school, that didn't exist, and we went from the fibrates to the statins and the statins are still standard of care but these new medicines is in addition to the statins or for those patients that are completely intolerant to statins and they work amazing I don't know, there, was a, there was an article recently in the new york times about you know before you guys were even students heart disease was so prevalent and patients were so commonly dying from fulminant mis or like sudden cardiac death Nowadays, we're seeing that less and less because of all these drugs, amazing drugs that, you know, we've been managing patients. So, but that's the complication of nephrotic syndrome. So, you already know these three. Accelerated atherosclerosis from severe hyperlipidemia, infection with encapsulated organisms, and thrombotic events. Okay? And I'm going to mention briefly the names of the diseases so we can save time. And I don't think it's relevant for you guys, but... Mem diabetes, membranous glomerulonephritis, FSGS, amyloidosis or renal amyloidosis has a lot of proteinuria, and minimal change disease. I already told you, blood minimal change associated with Hodgkin's. Okay, don't forget that one.
just do a good lymph node exam on your patients with, with uh, nephrotic syndrome and age appropriate screening for cancer or like abdominal imaging when it's membrane secondary membranes. Okay, in nephritic syndromes we have the most common gene in the world is I told you already, it's common in Asians and Hispanics. IgA. IgA nephropathy. So IgA nephropathy can give you a nephritic syndrome. And we also have uh, post-infectious glomerulonephritis. The most common is post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. Remember they give you a patient with either like a skin infection or like a superlative strep throat and then down the road. These patients present with profound, profound uh, renal failure. The good news is most of them recover. That's the good news. Let me get some water real quick. Post, um, that, that one you may get it on your boards. So the patients with a classic story got exposed and then profound renal failure. And you can see RBC cast in the urine. So if you hear cast, it can be a very benign finding or it can be a very ominous finding. If you see a granular cast, it can be a little bit of dehydration or it can be ATN. Remember we talked about Muddy Brown? If they tell you they saw a waxy cast, we see those mostly in, in nephrotic syndrome because they cholesterol, cholesterol, you know, a waxy cast, you can see that or they see there's, there is a cast called the Maltese cross. It's just like lipids. You see that in in nephrotic syndromes as well. By the way, patients with nephrotic syndrome on physical exam, they can have xanthelasmus. Remember those lipid depositions in the nose and the eyelids? Um, if they tell you that the patient has an RBC cast, that's very abnormal. That's actually uh, intrinsic diseases of the kidney. So there is another finding, there is a, you know, patients with renal disease, they get dysmorphic red blood cells in the urine, or they can get the pathognomonic cell of glomerular hematuria is called an acanthocyte. An acanthocyte, just imagine like a Mickey Mouse cell. It's just like the RBC that has been like deformed by passing through a glomeruli and they get these little tube labs. It looks like a Mickey Mouse. That's, is, 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 that's called an acanto, acanthocyte. Now, I want you guys to look pictures tonight and when you get home just google it and let me see if I can show you a picture because you need to know, you need to see this. Mm -hmm. Kind of just shear that it goes through. Exactly. Because okay. your, the, the, the hematuria can come from anywhere from the urinary tract, uterus, prostate, bladder, urethra, but an acanthocyte, there's only one place where it comes, which is the kidney. These are some examples. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Kind of a little speculated kind of. Mm-hmm. Huh. Yeah, so a um, mechanocyte is pathognomonic of glomerular hematuria. So when you see that as a nephrologist, I can't I need to justify why I'm not doing a biopsy. Either because the patient is too sick or the patient is not a candidate for immunosuppression, but this is glomerular hematuria until proven otherwise. So then we have, um, let's see what else we have. We have lupus can cause an nephritic syndrome. And in children, what they give you is a patient with subnephrotic proteinuria, red blood cells in the urine, and hypertension, remember? Whereas the adults, they may be normal tensive, but just more signs of volume overload and a lot of proteinuria, massive amounts of proteinuria. A frequent question that you may get on your board, this is a good tip for you, Vlad. So, multiple myeloma. Multiple myeloma is heavily tested on the boards. Don't ask me why. 
Um, it's like Theo. Is it common? No. <laughs> Is it common in your boards? Yeah, you better believe it. So multiple myeloma, they have what we call the mismatch of proteinuria. So when you calculate proteinuria, there's two ways of calculating proteinuria. Most labs, they do the dipstick, right? And they tell you whether or not there is albumin. The dipstick, the dipstick, um, it may be misleading because when you calculate the protein either by a 24-hour urine collection or by a spot urine for protein creatinine, just like a spot urine ratio, um, there is a mismatch because on the dipstick you only pick albumin, whereas in the other two you pick non-albumin protein. The reason is because they run the sulfacilic acid assay and the sulfacilic acid assay picks up non-albumin proteins like Ben's Jones proteins. So if they show you a question on your boards and that question shows the dipstick very a lot of like no protein and then on the quantification a lot of protein you already know that this patient has a non-albumin non-albumin proteinuria and that's not almost always multiple myeloma on your boards. So don't let them trick you. Okay? Okay, so let me think uh, uh, what else about nephritic? What other conditions? Alport syndrome. Alport syndrome, it's a form of um, IgA nephropathy mm -hmm. and it's actually autosome, no, it's X linked, mm -hmm. meaning that the mother carries the gene and you pass it on to your male child. And Alport's disease, there's no treatment. These patients actually develop, they're deaf and they develop renal failure. I have two patients with Alport's disease. There's no treatment. And the renal failure tends to be more severe than the typical IgA. Remember I told you IgA is more indolent? Most patients go unrecognized. They, they come under my care because they, they got disqualified for, for insurance. Yeah, but that's a good question. And another spectrum of disease that it also falls into the IgA nephropathy is uh, uh, this one, HSP, Hennig-Schollenpurpura, mostly in children, but I've seen adults. In children, it's a very benign, I wouldn't say benign because they get very sick, but it's, it's not severe damage, that's what I'm trying to say. They, they recover, like, like post-trep. Whereas patients with myeloma kidney and diabetic renal disease, patients have pretty bad prognosis. Really bad prognosis. Okay. Questions, guys? I guess I had a kind of question. So like us working in like primary care kind of like what are what would be some things where like, you know what, this patient has like uh, really high PU and creatinine ratio and interesting like your analysis, like maybe we should refer them now to like a nephrologist. Like what stuff should we kind of be on the lookout? Be like, you know, maybe reflex. Like, let's get a consult on this person. Excellent question. So, my advice to you: if you have a creatinine, it's just a muscle protein, and you need to learn how to recognize, how to interpret it in the right context. African Americans have higher creatinines than non-African American patients. They have more muscle mass. So, if you see a creatinine of 1.6, 1.5 in an African American patient, that may be normal. And if you want to make sure that you want to reassure the patient, because the patients these days are very sophisticated, they, they, get, they get access to their information, so they see the GFR, oh, my GFR is 60, I have kidney disease. That classification created a lot of anxiety. It was intended to raise awareness from non-nephrology providers mm -hmm. in, in when to refer timely to nephrology. And that was the good thing, and I think it raised a lot of awareness. The bad thing is that it ended up classifying people with a disease that they actually don't have. Mm -hmm. So your job is, for instance, if you, if, you, if you have an African muscular male and that patient wants reassurance, you do a 24-hour urine creatinine clearance. Mm -hmm. That's a more accurate estimation of the renal function. And my advice to you guys is pay attention to the urine. That's where the money is. If the urine has no red blood cells, no white blood cells, no protein, measure always proteinuria. Don't, don't just rely on the albumin mm -hmm. because of the example that I just gave you, multiple myeloma. So measure always like either a, do a spot urine for protein creatinine. If you see protein there in an abnormal number, 
very legit consult refer if you have a patient with a mildly elevated number you can start by doing an ultrasound you're, let's say you're doing primary care mm -hmm. you can do a renal ultrasound make sure there's no structural abnormalities or obstruction you do a ua bland urine sediment normal kidney function creatinine in 1.2 stable over the years the nephrologist is not going to do anything different but my advice to you is patients they're always going to appreciate that you you err on the right on the wrong side on the on their favor what they're not going to appreciate is that you miss something like an rpgn so that's why if if there is a take-home message from this talk look at the urine if there is a cantocytes red blood cell cast that's very abnormal if there is proteinuria that's not normal it needs to be investigated and at that point you guys can that's beyond your scope you just need to refer okay any other questions of course I've, used, uh, I've seen some doctors who it didn't really make sense but they can kind of I understand how the numbers, like the more dehydrated you are, you get usually higher, higher BUN because the body's trying to conserve water. But how would you assess hydration status when you're looking at like a BMP or something? Okay, so BUN can be elevated for many different settings, not necessarily dehydration. I'm going to give you three examples for important for blood when he's rotating on the words. Mm -hmm. If you put a patient on prednisone, BUN is going to go high. Okay. very high the higher the dose the higher the BUN if you're having a GI bleed these patients have a huge BUN if the patients are very catabolic let's say like a burn victim or like a crush trauma these patients are highly catabolic they're gonna have very high BUNs if you put a patient on TPN you know there's a lot of like amino acid breakdown and and release of BUN so I'm giving you examples because a lot of the doctors think like, oh, BUN is everything is about hydration. It isn't, and and obviously renal failure in patients with renal failure they have pretty high BUN. But BMP should not be used to assess volume and status in patients with renal failure. It's actually the label of the test is not for use in advanced renal failure not even dialysis dependent why because you can get a false positive so what I tell the patients I I rarely teach students I know you guys get heavily trained on 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 FINA and you know the fraction of excretion of urea and fraction of excretion of sodium and they tell you oh if it's less than one it's pre renal and if it's more than one is ATN there's lots of examples where you can actually get burned if you just make your decision. So my advice to you as an nephrologist is get a good history. If you get a good history, you already have a diagnosis. By the time you walk away from that, the bedside, you already know what you're dealing with. Get a good history about how many meals you eat, have you been vomiting, how's your blood pressure at home. Patients with uncontrolled diabetes, for instance, they become very prerenal because they get osmotic diuresis, the BUN can be high. And another principle that patients and even doctors, they fail very commonly is you tell the patients to drink a lot of fluid. In advanced kidney disease, you can't give that recommendation because think about you have a clot sink. If you keep putting water, you're going to overflow. That happens with kidney, advanced kidney failure. So a good recommendation for an average size adult with a stage 3 you can you can have two liters you can have 64 ounces if you have advanced kidney disease GFR is less than 30 I usually go down to 48 ounces if you are dialysis dependent you're not supposed to have more than one liter per day which is very hard and when you assess patients on dialysis that's an intelligent question if you're if you're actually if you're assessing them for a blood pressure problem you need to understand that if you're dialysis dependent, most of your blood pressure problems is going to come from excessive interdialytic weight gain. You guys know that if you go to a dialysis unit, you go on dialysis on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, right? If you are gaining more than one kilo per day, that's, that's the answer to the hypertension of that patient. Because how are you going to get rid of that? Most patients on dialysis, they're anuric. 
after some time on dialysis, the urine output is forever gone. They don't pee. If you go to, a dial if you go to my dialysis unit, they don't pee. Period. So that's, that's one thing to always remember. They're very volume sensitive. And a lot of the times people hear in the news like, no, I need to drink, especially Dr. Benzer's patients. They all need to be fluid restriction, fluid and sodium restricted. And very commonly, the only reason why you need to drink a lot is either because you have DI and you need to drink, otherwise your sodium is going to become very high. Mm -hmm. Or if you have stone disease, like multiple kidney stones, yeah, recommendation is drink as much as you can. But for the rest of my kidney disease patients, I never tell them drink, drink, drink. But it's all over the newspaper, the news. You need to maintain your kidney health, drink a lot. That's the wrong recommendation. You know, you tell the patients, you work outside, obviously, don't restrict yourself. But if you have a normal routine, there's a lot of habitual drinkers. I had a patient, I'm going to tell you stories. This is amazing, like what people do to their bodies. The guy was on three diuretics, maximum doses. He was on a thiazide, on a, on a loop diuretic, and he was on, on a losterone blocker, on a spironolactone. He had stage 3 to 4 kidney disease. His GFR was fluctuating between 28 to 32. On three doses, three diuretics maximum doses. He was on 90 milliequivalents of potassium. 90. 90 is, is, is like enough to kill, like, that's what they give you when they do a lethal injection. They give you 90, 100 milliequivalents. The guy was drinking. When I explained to him, when I sat down, because he had recurring admissions for CHF, when I sat down with him, I told him, like, I want you to be 100% honest with me. How much fluid do you drink? When I told him he needed to be on 32 ounces, he didn't believe me. He thought I was bullshitting him, I'm sorry. He thought I was like lying to him. And I said, why? Like, because I drink between 12 to 15 cans of 7-Up. I didn't even think like that was feasible or possible to drink 15 cans of 7-Up per day. Mm -hmm. And he was having between 150 to 200 ounces of fluid per day. So a lot of the patients are habitual drinkers. And there is a very, very well-rooted belief in the community that drinking, drinking helps the kidneys. If you have advanced kidney disease, just think about it. It's, there's so much water that those kidneys can handle. There's so much sodium that those kidneys can handle. So an important recommendation for patients with hypertension in advanced kidney disease is fluid restriction. If they overdo it, you're going to be chasing your tail. You're going to be giving them more and more antihypertensive, more diuretics. It's like a vicious cycle. Okay? Very good. Question, guys? All right. I'll try to come. I'll tell Rami when you guys are available and I'm happy to come and talk. We can talk about other things, endo or whatever you guys want to talk about.